Chapter 70. Anne, please remember to like, subscribe, and comment for each chapter. Chapter 70. A pleasant thrum zapped throughout his entire body, humming right up to the ends of his nerves, as he swung through the city streets of Queens. He had just dropped off Mary Jane at her apartment several minutes ago, and it had been excruciating to leave her there after the passionate evening they enjoyed together. More than anything, he wanted to be able to spend the night with her in his arms, holding her close so that the giddy sensation he felt in the pit of his stomach would never subside, surpassing even through the veil of sleep. Overall, he simply hadn't wanted the night to end. But he had to bring her home due to the fact that her aunt Annabelle wouldn't approve of Mary Jane spending the night, which was something that he couldn't help grumbling at. Regardless, it was probably for the best that she didn't sleep over simply due to the fact that he didn't want her to think that he was overcoddling her. His feelings may be stronger than hers, but he wouldn't make the mistake of moving too quickly when it came to their relationship. The very last thing that he wanted to do was to pressure her into feeling more when she simply didn't. More than anything, he wanted her feelings to be genuine, and not because she would feel the influential demand to return his love if he were to ever accidentally let it be known to her. So, Peter was following her lead, pacing his actions and words deliberately based on her social cues. He refused to issue any ultimatums that pushed their relationship over any boundaries, whether it be intentional or not. But the more he thought on it, the more that he realized that he honestly didn't mind that he had to wait to tell her the true extent of his feelings. Especially when he was able to express it physically with his body. A delectable shiver washed over him as he recalled the taste of her against the lapping of his tongue combined with the feeling of her mouth on him. Just the memory of it all caused his toes to curl and his stomach to swoop. When it came to Mary Jane Watson, Peter Parker knew that he was the luckiest man alive. She just made him a better human altogether. She was the driving factor that made him want to continue fighting, no matter how impossible the odds seemed. Which was why he was finally ready to face off with the crime lords of New York City tomorrow night. Especially Lincoln. Acidic bile threatened to roil over in his stomach just at the thought of the monstrous man. The bastard couldn't hide away from his crimes forever especially after what he had done to Mary Jane. He would pay for his horrific deeds. Peter would make sure of it. With one last swing, Peter arched his body in the air before latching himself onto the worn brick of his apartment building, just outside of his bedroom window. It was with mindless expertise that Peter managed to get the old window open with his sticky fingers, pushing it upward wide enough for him to slip through before he closed it securely behind him. His bedroom still smelled like her. Pausing, Peter made sure to inhale a large breath of air deeply through his nose, catching the waft of Mary Jane's floral-scented perfume and relishing in it. The only thing better would be if he could press his nose right up against the smooth skin of her neck and smell it right from the source. Sighing with longing, Peter pressed the button to his spider emblem and stepped out of the jumbled-up fabric once it pooled at his feet. Fishing out a sweatshirt from the hamper of clean clothes he had yet to put away, Peter threw it on along with a pair of loose sweatpants before stepping out into the hall, following the noises that were coming from the kitchen. May? Peter called, and as soon as he walked down the hall and into the small open space of the combined kitchen and living room area, May smiled over at him in greeting. Hey, Petey, she said as she stashed a box of oatmeal into the kitchen cupboard, with Happy standing in front of the open fridge as he helped unload a bag of items into it. Peter had caught them in the middle of putting away a grocery haul and immediately stepped forward in help. Hey, Peter greeted in return with a smile directed at the both of them as he set about putting away a bag of dry goods in another cupboard. How was work, May? It was fine, not as busy today. Happy here is going to watch a movie with me tonight. You're welcome to join us, Peter, Happy offered and Peter actually felt warm at the idea of the mundane activity after the chaos of the last couple of months. Plus, he wanted to spend some time with May. Between his responsibilities as Spider-Man and all the time he spent with Mary Jane, it felt almost like he was neglecting her. Sure, that sounds great. What are we watching? The Truman Show, May informed him and Peter nodded in acceptance of their evening plans as they continued to put away various items in their spots. They did this with minimal chatter as Peter mentally recalled the thought that he had earlier when he had been discussing future plans with Mary Jane, when she had been talking about how difficult it would be for her to get an audition without any previous connections, in the moment it had Peter thinking about the potential connections that he personally had. Or rather, the connections he had from being Spider-Man. And though they weren't connections that were directly tied with Broadway, 
Peter had met some wildly famous and important people over the years and perhaps one of them could help him out with this one favor. Besides, Broadway owed the Avengers one after the horrific display that was Rogers the musical. Hey, uh, happy? Peter asked as soon as they folded up the last reusable grocery bag, turning to face the man as he quirked a curious brow as he looked over at him. What's up, kid? Happy asked while May set about opening a bag of popcorn before putting it into the microwave. Do you, uh? Peter paused, lingering because he wasn't sure if merely asking would be deemed as insensitive or inappropriate in any way, given that he was fishing for ways to utilize Happy's friendship with Mr. Stark for Peter's own benefit. But then he reminded himself that he had been close to Mr. Stark too and trudged forward despite the discomfort he felt in asking the probing question. Do you know if Mr. Stark had any connections to Broadway? The question seemed to throw Happy off for a moment, staring at Peter with a perplexed expression marring his features. Well, that wasn't the question I was expecting. I'm not sure. Why do you ask? For a moment, he wondered if it was wrong of him to be requesting this. It felt like a form of nepotism in a way. But then again, that's just how the industry was. You had to know someone in order to get an opportunity sometimes. Because Mary Jane wants to break into Broadway, and I think that surprising her with an audition would be the perfect belated birthday gift. That's so sweet of you, Peter, May chimed in, popcorn bowl in hand as they all made their way to the living room. May and Happy sat on the couch together, holding hands, while Peter took the lone chair beside it. Yeah, I'll ask around and look into it, Happy said helpfully while May kicked her feet up and grabbed the remote next to her, turning on the TV before navigating to the correct streaming service. Peter could feel his whole face brightening at the confirmation. It wasn't a guarantee, but at the very least there was a chance that Mary Jane could follow her dreams because of this. And more than anything, Peter wanted to see her happy. Especially after she had been cruelly tricked by Lincoln into thinking that she was actually a model. Thanks, Happy. With a peek over at him, Happy did a modest one-shoulder shrug. I owe you one for all the things you've done for me. Peter waved him off letting him know without words that it was nothing. Everything that he's done was his responsibility, after all. On the screen, the opening scene to the movie came to life, the director of the Truman Show on screen as he gave his interview about the fictional show. It was several minutes into the movie when Aunt May finally spoke. How did the test go, sweetie? Hmm? Peter hummed as he looked away from the screen to meet her inquisitive gaze, it was fine. Easy, actually. It was easy. At least, it had seemed that way to him. Peter had no doubt in his mind that he passed with a high score. And Mary Jane? Aunt May probed. This question caused him to hesitate. Because he wasn't 100% sure of the answer. He could only determine based on how Mary Jane acted after the exam was finished. Which looking back, Peter found that he had a difficult time pinpointing what her expressions actually conveyed. She seemed less anxious after she was done with the test. He finally said, knowing that much at least was true. Aunt May seemed enthusiastically optimistic with this answer. Good. Hopefully that means that she passed. Yeah. But no matter the circumstances, Mary Jane wasn't going to follow him to Boston. The somber tone of his thoughts couldn't be helped. But immediately, he pushed back against them. He shouldn't be sour when it came to Mary Jane's decisions on her future. To ask her to throw away everything her life in New York, her dreams all just for him? It would make him the most selfish prick alive. I'm sure she passed with flying colors, Peter assured, not only Aunt May, but also himself, I don't know if you know this, but my girlfriend is amazing. We know, both May and Happy said together, with May laughing and Happy rolling his eyes. They were silent for a bit after that, watching the story unfold on the screen. It was when they got to the part where Truman discovers the pattern with the extras while sitting in the car, where Peter decided to finally broach an important topic with his Aunt May, no matter how awkward it was for him to ask. Hey May? Peter asked hesitantly as he shifted in his seat. He waited until May glanced over at him before he finished voicing his request, taking the plunge, can you? Call in sick to work and stay at Happy's place tomorrow night? May was scheduled the night shift tomorrow at her clinical job in Manhattan, which was where Peter had planned for the confrontation to take place. Now Happy was looking over at him quizzically while May tilted her head curiously at him, both looking at him like he grew two heads. Uh, sure. Why, Pete? A hand came up to scratch at the back of his head, 
mussing up his hair by threading it through his fingers. He knew before even saying it aloud that May wasn't going to like what he was about to say. I'm going to lure out some crime lords and I want you to be far away and safe. Peter, May said, a concerned look beginning to dawn on her features. I know you're worried, May, Peter rushed to reassure as Happy picked up the remote to pause the movie, but I have to end this to keep Mary Jane safe. If Lincoln shows up, I'll finally have him and can put him into custody. You want me to have S.H.I.E.L.D. on standby? Happy asked, his expression deadly serious as he immediately fell into the role of the head of security that he used to be. Peter hesitated at the offer, thinking it over with the gravity that it deserved. We're not on the best of terms right now, Peter said tactfully, his mind going to picture Nick Fury's face in his mind's eye. I think I trust General Ross more right now than Fury. But. Only call him for cleanup. Get them all to the raft prison. Not to mention that he didn't want a bunch of stray bullets flying about in an area where any civilian could happen to wander into unwittingly. Call me as soon as it's all done then, Happy said, his voice not quite a demand, but laced with the trust that Peter felt honored to have earned from the older man. Thanks, Happy, Peter said, something inside of his chest swelling at the confidence and faith he could clearly see displayed in his entire countenance. Like I said before, Happy went on to say with a shrug, pointing the remote at the television before pressing play on the movie again, I owe you. Peter gave him a soft smile at the sentiment, letting it be his voiceless response as they all returned their focus to the movie. But as Peter watched, Happy's last words to him repeated on a loop over and over again as a plan formulated in his mind. I owe you, Happy had said. It was nearing the end of the movie when Peter finally spoke up, the idea now pieced together enough for him to actually voice it. Hey, uh, Happy? Can I actually ask you for another favor? Upon reaching the building in Manhattan, Silver Sable was immediately escorted through the double doors past the receptionist without having to wait even a second. It was the sort of efficiency that she was usually pleased by, not much liking to waste her time with idleness, especially when it was Silver who had been summoned here by Wilson Fisk and not because she came here on her own merit. It was just as she remembered from when she was a young girl, coming here with her father as he came to conduct business dealings with the notorious, philanthropist, business tycoon. Wilson Fisk was known for both his generosity in the charitable society and his effectiveness in making a profitable deal. Overall, he was known as a good man by her father's standards. To her, she admired him adequately enough. Especially if the money she anticipated from his offer would go to help her beloved country some Korea. As Silver walked the halls, she passed by many rooms with wide windows where scientists in white lab coats seemed to be partaking in experiments. One of those men had tentacle-like metal arms that allowed him to work on experiments from a safe distance. Another room had an expansive opti chamber full of large vampire bats that swarmed in the room as they flew around, hunting in a pack as they drank the blood of a poor buck that was being sucked dry. While the third room she passed contained only a single pedestal that held up a small glass box encasing what looked to be black goo that was. Alive? The scientists seemed wary of getting close to it in that room. Silver refocused her attention on the hallway before her. The scientific experiments going on were none of her concern. In fact, they hardly impressed her. She traveled all the way from Sim Korea for this? She and her men had just taken down a large sect of Hydra, she could be helping them with the dismantling efforts right now but Fisk had insisted that a meeting between them was important. And Fisk had always had a close bond with her father. Plus, there was the added element of the money that he promised to pay her for her efforts, which would help in rebuilding the Simcarian economy. Finally, the men leading her stopped at two double-wide doors at the end of the long hall. The ornate wood was very sleek and modern with the pure silver hardware that one of the men grabbed hold of in order to pull open for her. Without wasting any more of her precious time, Silver stepped forward into the room, her entire demeanor conveying that she was actually the one that had ownership of this place rather than the large man that was sitting at the expansive desk made of pure glass. A closer look and Silver couldn't even detect a single smudge on the tabletop. It was spotlessly clean, as was the rest of the overly large room. From the floors and their reflective shine, to the men in black suits that lined themselves around Mr. Fisk, to Mr. Fisk himself and his own immaculate white suit. All of it was pristine. They would never survive a day in Sim Korea, that much Silver knew for certain. Silver, my how you've grown. Mr. Fisk greeted from across the room as he stood to receive her politely. His expression and manner were just the right amount of open warmness. 
mixed with the severity that every successful American businessman contained. So selfish and greedy. They didn't take care of their own people like she and her men did with her beloved Simcarians. Mr. Fisk, Silver greeted back formally with a small, courteous nod. Would you please sit? Mr. Fisk invited as his large, beefy hand extended itself to the chair that was available across from his desk. Silver frowned at it. She never liked to sit in front of those she didn't expressly trust. And though Mr. Fisk seemed to be a kind enough man, Silver found that she tended to demand more respect when she remained standing in front of men who tended to see themselves as her superior. I've been sitting for hours on the plane. I'd prefer to stand. There was no change on Mr. Fisk's features from her decline of his offer, only the lowering of his arm back to his side as he took the liberty of sitting again himself. Very well, then. Silver took the opportunity of stepping closer, however, not stopping until she stood over the spotless glass table that separated them. Do you have the money up front? She asked, wanting to get right to the point without wasting any more time with idle chit-chat, as Americans tended to do. Seeming to understand her desire for haste, Fisk snapped his fingers and one of his surrounding men stepped forward and produced a briefcase that he had been holding by his side. Placing it on the glass table, the man worked on opening the metal snaps that kept it shut before lifting the lid of it and turning it toward silver, openly on display for her eyes to see. Bundles of crisp American $100 bills met her keen gaze as Mr. Fisk gestured to the money with two open palms. Two million, as agreed upon. Without even touching it, she tried to mentally calculate if it was the correct amount. From her inward perusal, it seemed to be accurate. This money would help fund the new Sincarian school that needed to be built. So many children would benefit from this one business deal. With a snap, the briefcase was shut before her very eyes as the suited man collected it once more and stepped back into line behind Mr. Fisk. Silver's eyes followed the briefcase until it stopped moving and stayed stationary by the man's side. Only then did she meet Mr. Fisk's unwavering gaze, before she demanded, what is this job that would earn me this money? A slow quirk of the corner of his lip lifted as Mr. Fisk leaned back in his chair, his hands folding together over his bulging stomach. Have you heard of the superpowered individual that goes by the name of Spider-Man? The red and blue costumed figure came to her mind's eye just from the mention of his name. Of course she knew of the vigilante. He was in known collaboration with the Avengers, so he was obviously on her radar. Her latest report of him had been that he had returned to New York after working on a mission abroad in Europe. It had been brought to her attention due to his closer proximity to some Korea. Yes, he was known to be a hero to the masses, but she never trusted anyone on principle before they had the chance to earn it. Yes, she finally confirmed. Mr. Fisk took a moment before he responded, his lips twisting the slightest bit as he seemed to be studying her, until he finally said, the task that I require of you is to retrieve something that Spider-Man has stolen from my organization. She waited for an extended length of time for him to elaborate, but when he didn't say anything further, she narrowed her eyes dubiously. That is most suspicious indeed, because I thought that Spider-Man was a hero. He fought alongside the Avengers, did he not? In all of her reports of the wall crawler, she had never once heard of any instance where he had stolen any goods, especially from a well-renowned philanthropist such as Wilson Fisk. But Mr. Fisk didn't even hesitate before responding this time, and immediately told her, I have sources that tell me that Spider-Man has murdered Mysterio. He's gone rogue. And can no longer be trusted to do the right thing. The briefcase he stole contains a formula my scientists have concocted. It was intended to change the world, but in the wrong hands. It could be catastrophic. Alarm bells went off in her mind as she listened to his reasoning. In her reports of Spider-Man in London, it had been revealed that Mysterio's body had been found on London Bridge. Silver had just assumed that the man had died in battle while trying to protect the city, as many soldiers have done in the past, but it seemed that her reports had been missing a key detail. A detail that Spider-Man allegedly seemed to have expertly covered up. She would have to go back to her reports to ensure. But if Mr. Fisk was correct, then that made Spider-Man a murderer. And if there was something that Silver Sable despised more than anything, it was a murderer. Killing for a job was different. She only made sure to kill those who deserved the hand of death. But murder is deliberate. Precalculated. And most of all, senseless. Her mother had been murdered, and it was a crime that she saw to be unforgivable. Meaning? She probed, needing more information on what this formula was capable of and what exactly she was up against. 
cities would be destroyed. And not just New York, Mr. Fisk confirmed in a grave tone. Faces of so many children swarmed in Silver's mind. Thinking of them amongst the rubble of a devastated city. Some of those poor souls lying still in the middle of a street, with their eyes closed and never to open again. Everything within her hardened, a quiet simmering anger now lit in the depths of her chest. And where can I find the wall crawler? The smell was really starting to get to Peter. The rancid stench burned his nose and threatened his gag reflex, but he managed to keep swallowing back the bile that rose from his stomach to his throat in an attempt to just get through this meeting with Walter Hardy as quickly as possible. The last thing that he needed to happen was for him to have to pull up his mask just to throw up in the sewers. And not just any sewers, but the Manhattan sewers that were swarming with rats. How was Walter able to spend weeks down here? Peter could hardly stand ten minutes. And that was with him hanging upside down on a line of webbing and not touching anything in the putrid tunnel. Once I get my signal up, they should come confront me, Peter said, deliberately breathing through his mouth to try and mitigate the smell. But as a result, he sounded a bit nasally as he spoke, and they'll be distracted enough so that you can meet with your family and leave the city for some time. It was important that the white-haired man before him understood Peter's instructions on this, because it may be the only chance that he got to get away undetected. Peter was taking it upon himself to face off with New York's three most notorious crime lords, who also happened to be hunting down the cat burglar for Project Pachyderm. While Peter kept them occupied, it was Walter's chance to escape New York with his family without detection. Walter nodded along with Peter's every word, acutely listening and storing away the information in that photographic memory of his. I don't know how I could ever repay your kindness, Spider-Man. I don't deserve it. With a shake of his head, Peter waved him off before he even finished speaking. I can't ever look the other way ever again, Peter said gravely, you needed help. I won't turn my back on that. Without his permission, his mind shifted over to Uncle Ben. How his blood was stained on Peter's hands. Still, the man before him seemed to insist on pressing his gratitude. No words could ever thank you enough. My reward will be seeing you reunite with your wife and daughter again, Peter said, wanting to get past this so that he could get the hell out of there. Now, you remember where the rendezvous point is with the Avengers associate that I told you about? It was deliberate on his end to try and downplay his familiarity with Happy by referring to him as such. Yes, with Mr. Hogan. Yes. Peter nodded, noting that Walter said it matter-of-factly rather than checking with Peter if his facts were correct. He had no need for that, it was already stored into the memory base that was his brain. Yes, at the heliport on East River Piers in downtown Manhattan. Nodding again, Peter reflected on how glad he was that he only had to go over this a minimal amount of time with him and trust that he would be able to follow the directions exactly. Where you'll meet your family there and Mr. Hogan will fly you to a safe location. Again, I just feel that I need to thank you for... Please, Peter interrupted, feeling another wave of bile flooding his mouth when he accidentally inhaled the smell of sewage through his nose, no thanks necessary. I want to take down these clowns just as much as you want to be safe from them. He hoped that would be the end of it and he could go with his dignity still intact by holding in his lunch. But the man seemed to be starved for human interaction after spending so much time on his own. Peter could tell that he had a difficult time letting Peter go off on his own, even if it was only a few hours before he got to see his family again. If I were more of a betting man, Walter said, his voice sincere, I'd place my bets on you, Spider-Man. Ah, oh, gee. You have me blushing, Peter said, his voice only minimally dry but also honored by the amount of trust this man was showing in his abilities, now, I'll set off the signal at midnight. Make sure you slip out then. You may only have a small window of time while they are distracted for you to make your way to the heliport. Right. Got it. Good, Peter said, leaving a small window of opportunity open for him to say something further, but he didn't fill the silence. I've got to go now but good luck to you, all right? Releasing a shaky breath, Walter nodded, only displaying a slight amount of fear in the face of the unknown of what would happen this night. Same to you, Spider-Man. I'm forever in your debt for this. It was with the highest gratitude that for the first time in his life, Peter found himself thankful for the smoggy air of New York City after he vacated the manhole that was hidden in a back alleyway of Manhattan. With a deep breath, Peter finally felt free to fill his lungs to their fullest capacity without the smell of human waste assaulting his senses. He swung for a bit of time amongst the skyscrapers, 
trying to get that breeze going to help negate against the memory of that horrible stench, only minimally noticing the cries of Spider-Man. That came from the tourists below. When he finally felt normal enough again, Peter found himself pausing on a perch of a nearby skyscraper rooftop as he took out his phone from the hidden compartment in his suit. Unlocking it, he immediately pulled up his conversation with Mary Jane and began typing. Peter, don't go near Manhattan tonight, all right? Especially on the west end of town. It only took about a minute to get her response. Mary Jane, that's where it's gonna go down? He could somehow sense her anxiety about the fight that was to come through the screen. Peter, yeah at a construction site, so please, for my sanity, steer clear? Mary Jane, of course. I just... She paused. And Peter watched as the three bubbles appeared and disappeared multiple times, before. Mary Jane, can I call you? Without texting back, Peter pressed on her name icon to begin a call. Hey, Mary Jane said when she picked up. Hey yourself, Peter said in return, taking note of the underlying disquiet in her voice, everything okay? He was met with a heavy sigh in return, which immediately sent warning bells blaring in Peter's mind. Yes and no. I'm worried about you. Peter opened his mouth to respond but Mary Jane interjected before he had the chance to say anything. And before you say anything, it's not because I think you're not capable. I just. I worry because I care. MJ. And I didn't want to wish you luck over text because it seemed to. I don't know, blasé. So. Good luck, all right? She got out in a rush, before adding, and for the sake of my sanity, please try and stay safe. The passion and care that she had for him shot a wave of emotion through him, and he found his throat growing tight. I wish I could kiss you right now, Peter said quietly, with so much longing in his voice. More than anything, he wanted to hold her close, tell her that everything would be all right and have her actually believe it. Save it for afterward. Give us something that both of us can look forward to. There she was once again, having all the faith in the world in him, that he can defeat all three crime lords before coming to claim her kiss as his reward. It was her optimistic outlook on life that kept drawing him in over and over again. It was more than just her looks that made her so beautiful to him. It was her heart that shined the brightest of all. I love you were the unspoken words at the edge of his lips. But he somehow managed to hold it back by the last bouts of his strength when it came to his resolve and common sense. I promise to give you the biggest kiss of your life as soon as I lay eyes on you again. Peter vowed with all of the sincerity that he could manage to push into his voice, and I also promise to stay safe. Good. You better. They lingered in silence after that, neither wanting to hang up or even say goodbye. Until finally, Peter sighed. I've got to go. It's time to finish this. Go get him, tiger. Mary Jane said quietly. I love you. His thoughts longed to tell her, those three daunting words echoing in his mind. I'll see you tomorrow, Peter said instead before he forced himself to end the call. Sighing, Peter lifted his phone to his chest, clutching it to his heart for a moment as he squeezed his eyes tight, drawing in the strength that she gave him. Then he stood onto his feet and turned to the corner of the rooftop where he had stashed the briefcase he intended on bringing to the fight. It was empty, of course. Peter had already destroyed the only physical copy of Project PACHYDERM last night. This briefcase was intended to be a red herring to keep the crime lords both invested and distracted while Peter fought to subdue all three into submission, where they would all enjoy a lengthy stay at the raft prison. Grasping tight to the briefcase handle, Peter launched himself off the ledge of the building and started swinging in the direction of Midtown Manhattan, toward 42nd Street and Madison Avenue. It was where he intended to hold the fight. He had thought long and hard about his decision on this, and he knew that the location he chose had to be centrally located in order for his signal to be seen best by everyone. But not only that, it was also a large construction zone, meaning that there wouldn't be many innocent bystanders in the way while he would do his best at keeping everything contained to the one area but for extra precautions, Peter had an extra plan to ensure this. Regardless, Peter knew that Jolly Jonah was going to have a field day once he found out about the fight that occurred on public property that was likely to get some damage. But it really couldn't be helped. Peter had to lure the crime lords into a false sense of security. So that they wouldn't suspect that it was the trap it actually was that Peter had set for them. To signal them to Manhattan may just lull them into a sense of security on that front rather than if Peter had decided to draw them out of the city. As he swung, 
Peter double tapped on the side of his mask and dialed a number for one more phone call for the evening. It rang three times before the other end of the line picked up. Hello? came the deep voice that greeted him. Happy, Peter greeted back, performing an acrobatic swing in the air that helped to increase his momentum, now cutting through the air that much quicker that the wind was whipping past his mask and made it more difficult to hear Happy clearly. Yeah, where you at? Happy asked through the bustling noise of the city, is everything almost ready? I'm making my way over to the site, Peter confirmed, letting him know that things would be underway soon. I'll be looking for your spider signal on the skyline. What time are the Hardys meant to arrive? By midnight, Peter confirmed before he hesitated and replied with, Thanks for this, Happy. Anything for you, Spider-Man, Happy replied, a mixture of warmth and respect in his tone that had Peter's throat tightening with a small rush of emotion. After what happened with Quentin Beck, it felt good for him to know that he had people in his life that he knew he could rely on. With a click, they both hung up, as Peter doubled his efforts in making it to the site in Midtown. When he made it to the construction site, Peter took note of how completely abandoned it was of any and all workers due to how late the hour was. A large sign was placed in front of the fence, which blocked the dangerous sight of the incomplete skyscraper from the public, stating, The Baxter Building, opening late 2025, sponsored by the Leland Baxter Paper Company. With one last hefty swing, Peter landed in a perch on the top point of the tower crane that sat abandoned for the night, taking stock of the location and mentally came up with any potential strategy that he could use to his advantage for the upcoming fight. It was spacious, but Peter intended to use his webbing to ensure that the streets surrounding the site were also blocked off from public access, just as a precaution. His webbing would act as a perfect barrier that no one would be able to get past. There was also plenty of cement blocks sitting in various stacks on the ground of the lot that he could use to his advantage, not to mention large metal beams that could be utilized. With a deep breath, done with scoping out the site, Peter reached down and opened the hidden compartment on his leg and took out a pair of glasses, slipping them up the bridge of his nose to settle on his face. As soon as it was secure, the lenses came alive with light, the screen analyzing and confirming his identity. Edith? Peter asked. Hello, Peter. Edith greeted warmly, How can I assist you today? Peter paused momentarily, wondering for a second on how he should best word his request. I need the drones to show off my location at midnight, Peter finally said, as a lit spider signal in the sky. Certainly, Peter, Edith confirmed, the screen now displaying a countdown timer, I shall deploy the drones and set a countdown timer for midnight. Thanking her, Peter then took off the glasses and restored them in that hidden compartment in his suit again. Then, he took a deep breath, steadying himself for the fight that was coming soon, before he leapt gracefully off of his perch and released a web to catch his fall, directing himself toward the streets surrounding the construction site of the future Baxter building, where he began the task of shooting out giant spider webs that blocked each intersection from outside access. In response, he got a lot of car horns blaring at him along with expletives and middle finger salutes. But all that Peter could tell him was that it wasn't safe and that they just had to trust him. He hoped that in the end, after it was all over, they would understand and be glad that their commute had gotten detoured. Spider style. Hammerhead had been trailing Happy Hogan for the last couple of days. The man was a known associate for the Avengers, specifically for the late Tony Stark. And based off of surveillance from the attack in London, the man had claimed to work with Spider-Man while aiding the Watson girl. As a result, Tombstone wanted him to keep a close eye on the Burley Stark Industries employee, hoping that the man would slip up eventually and let some valuable information be known. As Hammerhead observed the middle-aged man, he noticed that Hogan carried a weight of nerves on his hefty shoulders. It was the way he walked so stiff, with a notable air of jitters as he looked anxiously behind him every so often. Especially the closer he got to Lower Manhattan. The man couldn't seem to keep himself from maintaining a calm facade to save his life. In what felt like no time at all, they finally stopped in front of a heliport right off the boardwalk by the sea. And after having a lengthy discussion with the staff there and what looked to be a pilot, Hogan took out his phone from his suit pocket as it rang. Hello? Hammerhead watched as Hogan conversed with the person on the other line, bored, which was understandable as he had been trailing the other man for days by this point. But then when Hogan name dropped the Hardys. Hammerhead knew that his patience was finally paying off. Especially when he said at the end of his call, Anything for you, Spider-Man. 
A rare feral grin stretched across Hammerhead's lips for a brief second as he waited several beats after Happy Hogan ended his call, waiting to confirm if it was actually the conclusion. When all was silent except for Hogan going to talk to the helicopter pilot once again, Hammerhead took a step back so that his body was hidden behind the nearby building. Where he reached into his suit pocket, gingerly to avoid upsetting his injuries, he pulled out his cell phone and pressed a button to start a call. Hey, boss. Hammerhead greeted in a low grumble, keeping his voice low, looks like our informant was right about Hogan. He was just on the phone with Spider-Man and I overheard him mention the Hardys arriving at midnight. Good. Came the gratified voice of Tombstone, and Hammerhead could hear the sinister grin in the other man's voice, then while the wall crawler is distracted by my competition, the real prize will be unguarded and ripe for the taking. The call ended not long after that and Hammerhead stored his phone back into his suit pocket as he continued to watch Hogan and waited for some of Tombstone's men to arrive as backup. But little did Hammerhead know, it wasn't just Tombstone and Hammerhead and had been listening in on the call. Across the city in his hideout in the Bronx, the Green Goblin sneered throughout the whole of the conversation he had overheard from the bug he had planted in Hammerhead's phone. That double-crossing Hammerhead will surely live to regret betraying me. The Goblin thought even as his mind whirred with his changing plans based on the new information he had overheard. The timer on his countdown was steadily decreasing, getting closer to when Edith was set to deploy the drones for his signal. And for the first time in years, Peter found himself praying underneath his breath, hoping with all his heart that everything would go off without a hitch and that he could defeat all three of the crime lords with minimal bodily injuries to himself. And not only that, he prayed that they would actually show up for the fight. He especially needed Lincoln to take the bait. Come on, Lincoln. Peter muttered under his breath as he tightened his fist around the handle of the empty briefcase, I'm right here. Come get me. It was vital that he ended this soon, so that Mary Jane wouldn't have to be living her life while looking over her shoulder constantly. So that the streets of New York would be cleaned up enough so that he could go to MIT without both guilt and worry. So that he could be free to live his life more in the way that he wanted to without Spider-Man interfering with that. Ten more seconds now until drone deployment. Peter closed his eyes, taking in a calming, steadying breath. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Eyes snapping open, Peter tilted his head back to peer upward. The drones hovered in the sky above him, previously invisible in the night sky, as they lit up with bright colors, illuminating in a pattern of his spider mask. There. It was done. No going back now. Either they came to fight him or they didn't. And if they did, then Peter was going to be here waiting for them, playing the part of wanting to make a deal. Time passed. And Peter found that he wasn't quite capable of tracking the passage of it adequately. He found his eyes falling closed as he honed in on his senses. Listening to the breeze whip against his mask as it harmonized with the sound of his own breathing. Inhaling in slowly through his nose and out through his mouth over and over again as. A flash of his spider sense went off and Peter's eyes snapped open wide a split second before he ducked his head just in time to avoid the sharp dagger that had been hurtling towards the spot his face had previously been. Whoa. But he didn't even have a chance to breathe or even process the change in dynamics, because a woman flying in a jetpack was charging right at him. With a battle cry, she swiped at him, which was armed with yet another knife that just narrowly missed his throat as Peter somersaulted backward to avoid the cut. It was with that minimal distance that he created between them where Peter was finally able to get a good look at her. She appeared to be older than him, her face looking to be in her twenties despite her long, flowing silvery hair that matched her silver skin-tight jumpsuit outfit. Without missing a beat, she pulled out a gun from seemingly nowhere and pointed it right at his head. Peter's spider sense blared as it pushed him to move. With a shot of his webbing at a nearby pillar, Peter used the taut pull of it to swing him out of the way just a second before she opened fire on the spot he had been previously. To say that Peter was flabbergasted by not only this woman's presence, but also of her hunting of him for no apparent reason, would be an understatement. Who are you? Why are you fighting me? Peter cried out as he continued a circular swing around the surroundings of the construction site, the bang of her gun following him just a second too late. Return the formula that you stole and I will allow you to live. She finally yelled her demand at him in a thick, Russian-sounding accent as she aimed her gun to shoot at him again. Gritting his teeth in frustration, 
Peter shot out a web that caught onto the barrel of her gun before he yanked it out of her hands. Formula I stole? Peter stressed, confused beyond all belief. Did she she seriously thought that he was a criminal here? You've got it all wrong, lady, I didn't. The next words he was about to say were cut off in his throat as a sharp zap of his spider sense vibrated in his head. Look out, Peter cried out as a pumpkin bomb was thrown in their direction from the shadows. Reacting on pure instinct alone, Peter grabbed the silver-haired lady, wrapped her in his arms, and tore her away to avoid the blast. Boom! The explosion shook the surrounding area and caused his ears to ring from it being so close, but with it brought a cloud of green smoke that quickly spread through the expanse of space. Deep maniacal laughter echoed the area, but it was difficult to pinpoint where exactly it was originating from through the thick smoke. And Peter couldn't tell whether it was his own anxiety playing tricks on him or not, but it seemed like he could hear the whirring of the goblin's glider everywhere. Are you all right? Peter asked the woman, panting as he tried to gather his bearings while his eyes desperately searched for the goblin. Only to get a knife slashed on his arm from the woman, Peter being just a beat too slow and trying to avoid it. Her hand reached out to try and grab the briefcase from his fist around the handle, but he pushed her forcibly away with a hiss of pain, her jetpack catching her fall with ease. Peter had to actively resist from reaching up to cover the wound with his hand, instead keeping his hand steady and tight on his webline. Ouch. Hey. Can't we talk this out? I don't have conversations with murderers. The woman screamed at him, pulling out yet another gun from her jumpsuit. Was her outfit the skin-tight version of Mary Poppins' hat or something? Where the fuck did she keep pulling these weapons from? Still, that wasn't the only thing that stopped Peter short. Murderer? She was accusing him of murder? His first thought immediately flashed to Uncle Ben. And how Peter had been partially responsible for his death just from pure negligence in his responsibility. But then his mind rebelled against the notion. He shouldn't gain the term of murderer for what happened to Uncle Ben. There were plenty of other things that Peter could be accused of being, but he felt that murderer was definitely not on that list. Selfish, perhaps. Moody. Perhaps even naive. But, murderer? Peter's voice stressed, unable to fully comprehend the weight behind the claim she lay at his feet, wah? Another pumpkin bomb was thrown his way, interrupting what was bound to be a baffling speech that would be filled to the brim with confusion. Aided by another flash of his spider sense, Peter once again dodged the projectile bomb as he gritted his teeth in frustration. Glancing to his side, Peter saw that the woman had been caught in the aftershocks of the blast, causing her to hurtle a good distance away in the air. Already this wasn't going as planned. Not only has Lincoln and Kingpin yet to show up, but there was this random woman who was keen on trying to kill him for misplaced accusations of murder and lastly, he couldn't even see the green goblin through this blasted green smoke that was taking its sweet time to dissipate. As Peter landed sideways on a bare stone pillar, he shook a tightened fist threateningly at the open air. Come out and face me, goblin. Peter raged, his eyes wildly trying to pinpoint any sign of his silhouette through the green fog. He hoped that at least he would be able to bait him out with his taunting, unless you like being a coward that hides behind his bombs? It was with a mixture of satisfaction and relief when the green goblin flew out of the shadows and threw a wall of smoke, on a new industrial grade glider. Peter watched with daunting trepidation as he was now face to face with the green goblin once more. His heart was pounding as flashbacks of his previous fight with the madman came to mind, the one that he had lost. It seemed that the goblin recalled as well, as there was a knowing gleam in the look of his eyes as his nano-holographic mask morphed into a slow, sinister grin. The glider flew slowly forward as the goblin spread his arms wide, almost as though he were the one that was welcoming Peter here. But what bothered Peter the most was how unbothered the goblin seemed by his lack of control over the situation compared to the last time they squared off. The goblin almost seemed at ease as he tittered to himself. Just a little bit of warm-up. Wanting to see for myself if you were out of practice with that spider sense of yours. The voice that haunted some of Peter's nightmares caused a cold sweat to break out over his entire body. Still, Peter tried to swallow back that fear while attempting to reclaim any ounce of bravado that he could, enough that his voice didn't shake when he came back with a rebuttal of, I'm sure that you're sad to see that it's still whirring like a well-oiled machine. You won't be able to get the drop on me this time, Dobby. I called the shots for our little encounter this time. The glint in his eyes didn't diminish in the slightest, instead the goblin merely looked amused by Peter's attempt at intimidation. Yes. You did, didn't you? 
That's no matter. I'm not here to kill you. At least, not this time. I've only come for what is rightfully mine. It doesn't belong to you, Sable cried as she charged forward on her jetpack, shooting round after round of bullets at Peter as his spider sense propelled his body into action. Either of you. W-H-O even are you? Peter exclaimed at her as his live form evaded her every attack, much to her frustration as she screamed out in fury the more that she failed in her objective of killing him. As a result, she neglected to answer his question regarding her identity. As he sidestepped each bullet, the goblin threw another pumpkin bomb into the mix, cackling wildly as he did so. More smoke was added to the space and Peter grunted with the effort of performing all these acts one-handed, his hold still on the briefcase making matters more difficult. Then, eyes catching on the piles of cement blocks below, Peter decided that he needed to find an opening to get one of them out of the fight so that he could focus on just squaring off with just one for a while. And out of the two, the silver-haired woman seemed to be the easier target to get rid of. With an acrobatic flip in the air, Peter landed on the side of the nearby construction crane and cast out a web line down below, waiting until he felt the familiar sensation of it meeting its mark as it latched onto the object he had been aiming for. At the same moment he pulled hard on the line of his webbing, Peter propelled himself off of the crane and used the momentum to swing the cement block up and around his head, similar to that of helicopter wings. The speed of the blunt object quickly built before Peter let go and launched it right at the control panel of the woman's jetpack. Upon collision, it caused her to hurtle upward high into the sky as the flying device malfunctioned, the woman letting out a garbled noise of shock as her only response. Peter watched it occur with satisfaction, knowing that she would eventually be able to maintain control of it again but it would buy Peter time to deal with the goblin. Releasing another web, Peter used it to catch his fall before he immediately swung upward, attacking the goblin from underneath, his foot coming up to strike hard against the goblin's masked face. There was a distinct crunching noise that resounded from the impact, implying that Peter had broken the other man's nose. A small stroke of pride swelled in Peter's chest as he noted that he currently had the upper hand over the madman. You say that you don't want to kill me, Peter commented as he somersaulted in the air in an attempt to deliver a second attack while the goblin was still caught unawares. But the goblin managed to evade the knee that Peter had aimed for his chin by dipping his glider lower in a swift movement. Not yet. The goblin corrected, showing no sign of pain as he glanced up at Peter, watching as he attached himself to a nearby wall for a mere second before he launched himself off from it again, diving down at the goblin with his fist extended. Right. Not yet. Peter mused, delivering a blow that connected with the goblin's stomach, this time, Peter got the satisfaction of hearing the breath be forced from out of the other man's lungs. But still, the goblin's masked face remained unchanged from his smirking expression, not even diminishing from the sight of blood that was dripping from the goblin's green nose. Peter shook his head violently as he also steadied his footing on the goblin's glider, deciding to perch there while trying to remain unaffected by the goblin's lack of reaction as he threw another punch, this one the goblin dodged with a weave of his head, why is that? The leer on the goblin's lips grew more pronounced as he threw his own fist at Peter's gut, but Peter's spider sense had saved him from it once again. I may yet change my mind on killing you. That's still up in the air. But I was rather hoping that you realize your untapped potential in joining me. The proposition was just as bizarre for him to hear this time around as it was the first time that the goblin offered this exact same thing nearly six years ago. You're still offering me a job? Peter asked incredulously unable to hide his wide-eyed surprise from his voice, something that the goblin didn't miss. He chuckled good-naturedly, as though they were merely old friends discussing the merits of a mutually beneficial deal. What good is a spider unless it's under someone else's boot? Let me guess. Peter mused as his fist cracked along the goblin's jaw, you imagine that boot to be purple and smelling like Thor's back sweat? Reeking like a god, the goblin agreed, with a self-satisfied sneer, sounds about right. Despite himself, Peter rolled his eyes underneath his mask. There was nothing more distasteful to him than a man with an ego that didn't deserve it. And with all the lives that the goblin has ruined, even killed, he definitely didn't deserve it. A boss with a god complex? Yeah. I'm gonna pass. I've read too many horror stories online to fall into that trap. It was still so disarming for Peter to see that the goblin still remained unaffected emotionally by his taunting jabs. The only reason why Peter was still saying them was because they happened to be making himself feel better rather than terrified out of his wits, 
but that fear was slowly dissipating with each hit he managed to land on the goblin's form. Had he just imagined the horrific effect that the goblin had on him the last time that they had fought? Had he somehow built it all up in his head to be something more grand than it actually was? Was he, perhaps, stronger than the green goblin? More resilient? It was with another successful crack at the goblin's bloody mouth where the goblin finally retaliated by grabbing hold of both of Peter's shoulders before landing a knee right in Peter's abdomen while simultaneously cracking his head forward so that it collided with Peter's in a poignant headbutt. The air left his lungs in an instant, coming out in a wheeze as he was unceremoniously reminded of the green goblin's strength. Easy to remember by the way it also felt as though his head had just been split in two. Then I've changed my mind, the goblin said coolly, in the most tame and level voice that Peter had ever heard from him as the goblin tightened his grip on Peter's shoulders and pulled him close, enough for the goblin to whisper in Peter's ear. I suppose I will kill you, after all. Breath hitching, Peter felt as undiluted fear spiked up the back of his spine, a cold sweat breaking out on the back of his neck as a result while his heart threatened to pound out of his chest. He fought to try and reclaim control, wanting to get back to that level of confident ease that the head somehow managed to muster up for several minutes of their fight, but Peter found that it wasn't as easy to grasp now as he watched as the blood dripping from the goblin's nose trickled down to stain his yellow teeth, bloodying the bone-chilling smile that was directed his way. Confirming without words that he meant to stand by his threat against Peter's life and follow them through. Back off, elf. A rageful feminine voice roared off from their side, and with a peek to his left, Peter could see that the silver-haired woman had recovered her control over her jetpack and was soaring through the air like a bullet straight for them. A star blade clasped tight in her outstretched hand. He's mine. She made impact with the two of them, cut sliced along his arms and chest from her blade, but her actions managed to free Peter from the goblin's steely grip, something that he gladly took advantage of by gaining even more distance from the two of them. Though as a result of the collision, the woman once again lost control of her jetpack and was slowly falling in a spiral down to the ground below. Zipping with his web upward, Peter perched up on top of a nearby column, rasping out heaving breaths for several seconds before he forced himself to call out in a deliberately light tone. I didn't realize that I was such a hot commodity. It was best that he didn't let them detect any sign of his fear. It could be used against him in a way that could be detrimental to his life. And yet, the public seems to hate you regardless, the goblin mused, his glider rising in the air to follow Peter, his eyes now set on the briefcase that Peter still had grasped tight, you're only ever worth as much as what you can give to them. But their greed will only ever ensure that they will only take from you. The same thing could be said about you, Peter said, as he leapt from the column and over to the construction crane as soon as the goblin got close enough, needing more time to collect himself before he could continue on with the fight. And right now, distraction seemed to be the best tactic. Seems like you want a lot from me, as well. There are many benefits from working for me, the goblin said, stalking him around the site like a lion preparing to strike on its prey. Peter watched as the goblin slowly took out another pumpkin bomb and held it in hand, casually tossing it up in the air without giving any indication of when he intended on throwing it. Thank God for Peter's spider sense, he'd be dead without it at least 100 times over, by now. Internally, he was calculating the best angle that he could set himself up in so that he could web that pumpkin bomb right out of the goblin's hand. But the goblin was quick, so Peter needed to get the jump on him about it and do it right the first time. But the offer has now expired. Just as you soon will be. Spider-Man will only find justice from my hand, Sable roared from below, now standing firm on the ground as she took out yet another gun and shot a steady stream of bullets upward at them, with Peter neatly dodging them all. Do you hate all men? Peter snarked down at her, now aggravated by her very presence since she was a distraction to him with her constant stream of lead rounds. He needed to find a way to subdue her from this fight, or just the spider kind? All you murderers are the same to me. She screeched back, her Russian accent thicker sounding with the extra rush of emotion in her voice. Who exactly is it that you think that I murdered? Peter couldn't help but ask, curiosity getting the better of him. But then he saw a small window of opportunity and decided that it was either now or never. With a glob of webbing, Peter successfully blocked the barrel of her gun, gobbing it up with a sticky substance so effectively that it made the weapon entirely useless. If she tried to use it now, the gun would only backfire on her. Something that the woman must have realized as well, as it had her throwing it down on the ground in rage. Mysterio. 
She screamed back at him, her tone biting, practically using the name as a means to curse him. And it actually worked. Peter found himself stunned, not only by the accusation, but also by the name of the man who had deceived him so severely. The betrayal of which still cut him deeply. Ha! Huh. The goblin cackled, for a moment forgetting his pursuit of Peter as he grasped his stomach tight in his arms in an attempt to maintain his laughter, isn't that rich? I never knew that you had that killer instinct in you, Spider-Man. So many questions were swarming through his mind at a mile a minute. How did she even know what had happened with Mysterio? Why did she falsely believe that Peter had murdered him? And why did she care enough to hunt him down for it? I didn't murder Mysterio, Peter cried out, his voice stressed as he attempted to clear his name with this woman who was hellbent on seeing his body buried six feet under. Because if he managed to convince her of his innocence, then perhaps she would stop her ridiculous pursuit of him. He killed himself. He was a fraud that stole Stark Industries tech that he was using too. I grow tired of all of this chatter, the goblin interrupted, and Peter's head managed to divert his attention away from the silver-haired woman to that of the madman at the very same moment that the goblin tossed the pumpkin bomb at Peter. The close range of the throw meant that Peter wouldn't be able to entirely avoid the blast, and he braced himself even as he attempted to dodge out of its way. But no such explosion occurred. Instead, what was released from the bomb was an exponentially large amount of green smoke. Peter coughed harshly as it hit him square in the face. He could feel the burning tingles as it was engulfed through his nostrils and down into his lungs. What what was that? Peter managed to gasp out in between hacking coughs, struggling for air as the smoke slowly dissipated, much faster than it had with the previous bombs. The goblin cackled, the most maniacal grin on his bloody green face with signs of victory shining from his beady eyes. A special concoction of gas just for you, Spider-Man. Still coughing, trying desperately to inhale any form of fresh oxygen with each hacking breath, Peter found that fear once again clawed its way up his throat, taking its claim over him. His eyes watered as they stung with pain. What exactly was it that the goblin poisoned him with? Gas? Gas for what? Out of the corner of his vision, Peter saw that the silver-haired woman below had froze and was gaping up at them, seeming conflicted now as she witnessed everything at hand. At the very least, she should be able to see that the goblin was a bad guy, right? And as a result, know that Peter was the good guy in this scenario? So that I can do this. The goblin shot forward at him with such speed that Peter blinked and the goblin was suddenly upon him, his hard knuckles hitting Peter square in the jaw that left him dazed. Peter gasped out at the sheer pain that accosted him, reeling from the attack that he hadn't seen coming. That he hadn't seen coming. Peter's brain stopped short. Why hadn't his spider sense warned him? Why hadn't it sensed the attack before it had even occurred? But Peter hadn't had the time to contemplate that further, as yet another blow came at him from the goblin that he hadn't been able to preconceive. Blood spurted from his torn lip, now fat and throbbing with agonizing strain against the rapid swelling. With such speed, the goblin's fist wrapped itself around Peter's neck, holding him steady as he unloaded a series of blows everywhere his knuckles could reach on Peter's body. The hard ridges of the goblin's knuckles scraped the skin on his jawline, shedding blood with every pummeling strike. The whirring of the goblin's glider surged with new life as he flew forward in a surge of velocity with Peter still dangling in hand before he tossed his body as though he were nothing more than a rag doll. The back of his head slammed against a concrete pillar behind him, so hard that Peter saw bursts of light as his body fell forward and onto the dusty ground below. The impact caused a cracking sound that Peter knew to be a broken bone, but he couldn't quite register where it came from. Everything already hurt. The whirring purr of the goblin's glider approached as Peter struggled to stagger to his feet, fighting against varying waves of dizziness all the while, but too late as the goblin was already before him, blood dripping off his face and onto Peter's own as his fist struck downward like a cobra and squeezed around Peter's throat once more. A sinister grin grew steadily on the goblin's bloody lips and horrible memories scorned Peter from their last encounter as he once again noted the red staining the man's teeth, just as it did now. Violent shivers roiled down his back, fear stabbing at his every sense, ice cold as it accosted him while he fought to breathe. And still, his spider sense evaded him. And he had never felt more vulnerable and scared now without it. Losing his spider sense was almost the same as him losing a limb or his eyesight. He was punching in the dark without it. Especially now as the fist around his throat tightened to such a degree that he couldn't even breathe anymore. The goblin gave a dark chuckle as more drops of blood dripped down onto Peter's face. 
His heart was pounding in sheer terror, in rebellion against the lack of oxygen his brain was crying out for at the moment. He struggled against the hold, looking for any weaknesses, any form of a lifeline that could help him to escape, but the goblin was unyielding. When it came to strength, they were equally matched. Struggling despite the grim reality, Peter brought his hands upward in a spasm, only to be met with a slam of the briefcase he hadn't realized he was still desperately holding onto against the goblin's form. It did nothing to hinder the goblin in his pursuit of murdering him. But it reminded Peter of its existence. And using it may be his only chance at survival. With a sudden surge of strength, Peter threw his arm over his head and threw the briefcase far over to the side, hearing as it collided with the dirt floor before skittering across it until it landed firmly right at the silver-haired woman's feet. The goblin stopped short, whipping his head to the side to watch the projectile of the briefcase in the air. The woman had watched it as well, and after it had landed, she only hesitated for a mere second before she scooped it up and clasped the handle tight in hand. With a bang of her fist against the side controls of her jetpack, she was just as suddenly in the air once more, making the beginning of her escape with her prize while flying upward towards the sky. The goblin had been effectively distracted by her quick maneuvering with the very object he had coveted for himself. Peter used that to his full advantage as he strong-armed his way out of the now lax grip around his throat, squeezing out of the little space that this created. Now free, Peter heaved in lungfuls of air as best as he was able, already feeling bruises forming at his throat that left him feeling hoarse and raw. It was just as it had been the last time he fought the goblin, every part of his body was in agony. His ribs were bruised and aching. He could feel the cold sweat from his brow leak into the fabric of his mask as he pushed himself further away from the goblin, and he hated the feeling of it. He could taste it as it saturated through the fabric, the saltiness of it triggering bile at the back of his throat. The distinct smell of lead from his open wound burned his nose. He fought to stay conscious through the fog in his brain. With a sound of frustration breaking loose of the goblin's lips, he spared one look over at Peter before he reached into his bag and produced yet another pumpkin bomb. If in better condition, and if his spider sense had been working properly, Peter may have had the foresight to be able to stop him before it even happened. But the fact of the matter was that Peter was the weakest he's felt in quite some time. And as a result, Peter could only watch with delayed reaction as the goblin threw his arm back and tossed the pumpkin bomb up at where the silver-haired woman was making her escape with a briefcase. No, Peter cried out, quickly trying to release a web in an attempt to catch the bomb before it could fully reach her, but the goblin must have predicted this move as his glider ascended with such speed, that Peter hadn't even seen the blades unleash from hidden compartments at the front of the glider to cut at the web strands. Boom! The pumpkin bomb detonated in an explosion that blasted the woman against one of the concrete pillars, burns blistering her skin as an involuntary cry burst from her lips. Still, she kept a firm grip on the handle of the briefcase and Peter had to admire her internal strength for it. She was honestly lucky to still be afloat in the air after getting caught in that blast. But it wasn't going to help her for long as the goblin was in hot pursuit, flying his back glider skyward, the blade still extended from the front of it while the goblin cackled wildly. A surge of adrenaline shot through him just from his knowledge of the precarious situation that the woman was in simply because she took the briefcase that Peter threw at her feet. It was now his responsibility to ensure that she remained safe and unharmed. Which by the looks of it, the goblin had murderous intentions. To the goblin, it mattered very little if this woman survived, so long as he got what he came here for. Flipping forward and landing on his feet, Peter grabbed and lifted a metal beam that had not yet been installed for the new building. Securely in his arms, Peter held it like a baseball bat before twisting it and his body around in a tight circle, building enough momentum for him to finally launch the metal beam upward in the air, shooting off like an abnormally large spear until it hit upon the goblin with a striking clang. Ike! The goblin cried as he nearly lost balance on his glider, having been knocked off kilter from its trajectory. Peter didn't waste any time, shooting off two separate web lines that he used to propel himself upward like a slingshot, doing his best to intervene in the fight and have the goblin refocus his attention on him rather than the woman. He may be battered and bruised. But he still knew that he held a higher chance at defeating the green goblin than this woman did with her knives and guns. Even without the aid of his spider sense. His body cut through the air like a rocket, decreasing the space between him and them. When he got close enough to the goblin to reach out and grab his glider, he got a purple boot stomping down on his face, disrupting Peter's ascent. And just as he began to fall, his hand preparing to release a web to catch himself, 
yet another pumpkin bomb was dropped down towards him. Boom. He noticed it a beat too late, unable to fully get out of the way of the fiery explosion. Burns plastered bits of his suit to his skin, and Peter had to bite his tongue in order to keep from crying out in agony by it, knowing that they would blister horrifically with second-degree burns before his superhealing managed to kick in. Gritting his teeth against the brutal pain, Peter shot out a web, planning on his second attempt at entering the fray, when, boom. Up above, the goblin had thrown another bomb near the woman, the blast that she miraculously was able to avoid this time by letting herself fall several feet in the air. And with an extraordinary amount of inner drive, the woman produced a horde of star blades that she chucked one after another towards the goblin's encroaching form. And to her credit, she managed to get plenty of hits that impacted on his skin, still the goblin didn't seem to be all that affected by the pain these wounds inflicted. You aren't taking the formula from me. The woman screamed furiously at the goblin, as she pushed off the wall and attempted to escape with the briefcase by flying skyward with her jetpack. The goblin cackled as he gave chase, while Peter was web-sipping upward as fast as he could. Goblin, Peter cried, trying to regain the maniac's attention onto him, stop. All he got in response was more maniacal laughter as another pumpkin bomb was produced in his hand. Peter tensed at the sight of it, bracing himself for yet another explosion headed his way. But once again, his guess was off without the aid of his spider sense. Because the goblin extended his fist back and threw the bomb upward at the silver-haired woman. No. Boom. The explosion went off much closer to the woman this time, and now she was falling. Seemingly unconscious, or outright dead, with small licks of flame sticking to the right side of her jumpsuit. Scattered in the air around her, bits of the destroyed briefcase came down in a rainfall of debris. In the next instance, Peter caught the woman's body before latching onto one of the pillars, patting down her side with his hands to extinguish the flames, before he shook her body lightly in his arms, trying to ascertain if she was all right. Ma'am? Ma'am? Are you all right? Peter said as he continued to shake her, please tell me you're all right. In his peripheral vision, he saw as the goblin caught some of the raining debris from the briefcase in his hand, staring down at it with a scowl. Serves him fucking right? Peter couldn't help but think, despite knowing that there never was anything in the briefcase for him to steal. Ma'am? Can you hear me? Peter urged as he lightly tapped on the side of her cheek, before he rethought his actions and put his fingers at the pulse point on her neck. He breathed a sigh of relief when there was still a heartbeat that he could feel there. A slow and feral grin began to overtake the goblin's scowl as he tightened his fist around the debris in his hand. Then with a look down at Peter, he gave a low tittering chuckle. Looks like it's time for plan B, he said in a low and dangerous tone and fear washed over him like a bucket of cold water being poured over his head. Was the goblin going to attack him? Right now? For revenge against losing the P-A-C-H-Y-D-E-R-M formula? Peter's gaze stared wide-eyed at the masked man, his mind buzzing with plans on what he should do to escape the attack with both his and this woman's lives intact. Only Peter found that he didn't have much of a plan besides trying to dodge any attack and get out as soon as he could with the woman in tow. But that plan seemed nearly impossible without his spider sense. He felt so entirely lost without it. He had been living life with his spider sense for so long that it was difficult for him to maneuver a mere step without it now. Without it, he had to rely entirely on himself for what moves would be the correct ones to make, and the prospect of that terrified him. No. He wouldn't just wait for the goblin to attack him. He would be the one on the offensive. It was the only way. With a mighty battle cry, Peter used his feet to push off the pillar as he cut through the air straight for the goblin, the woman still firmly settled in his arms. Flipping his body, he stuck his foot out as he prepared for a brutal kick right at the goblin's bloody face, but to add more odds to his favor, he also pushed down on his web shooters, splattering the goblin with as much web fluid as he could before his boot collided with the goblin's smug mouth. It worked. It actually worked. The impact unsteadied the goblin and it was now Peter's chance to escape with a silver-haired woman in order to get her help. But there was a part of him that regretted running away. Because how soon would he be able to find the goblin again after this if he just let him go? How many crime sprees and murders would take place if Peter left him to his own devices now? But for all he knew, the silver-haired woman could be dying. Unless. Thinking quickly, Peter freed one of his arms from supporting the woman's body and grabbed a spider tracer from his belt, tossing it onto the goblin's glider as he struggled against the webbing that held the green goblin stuck in place. 
It unfortunately didn't hold him for long. And as Peter made his way out of the construction zone, he saw out of the corner of his vision as the goblin flew out of the area, headed southbound as he weaved through the skyscraper buildings. Peter would soon be hot on his tail, tracking him through the spider tracer he had planted on the goblin's glider. But he first had to get this woman professional medical attention. It was with the aid of shadows and darkness that Felicia Hardy and her mother maneuvered down the boardwalk to the heliport in downtown Manhattan, where they were meeting her father to finally escape the city, free from being confined to the house at last. She had always preferred the coverage that the veil of night provided. Nighttime was mysterious. Alluring. And such things were enticing to her, always managing to draw her in. They only had one more block before they made it to the heliport, having abandoned their car down the street. And then Felicia would be free to roam the outside world once more. Freedom was so sweet that she could taste the ghost of it on the tip of her tongue. She clasped on tight to her mother's hand as they continued to walk forward, where they finally passed the last building that obscured their view of the intended meeting place. A breath escaped her as she saw a form standing among others up ahead, right by the awaiting helicopter. Emotion swelled over her as she took in the telltale tufts of shocking white hair that stood out within the group of men. Hair that could only belong to her father. Tears spilled over the brim of her eyes at the sight of him, there had been an aching hole of longing in her chest that she had after not being able to see him for so long. These last few months had been hell. She had only been able to reunite with her father for a measly three days when he came back from the blip before he had to go into hiding. Because for some reason, her father grew a conscience and refused to make the same business dealings that he had before. As a result, his former clientele was after not only him, but Felicia and her mother were in danger as well. Still, none of that dampened her joy at seeing him again. She couldn't help but run forward the remaining distance before she crashed into his open and awaiting arms, his embrace warm and comforting. Immediately, she felt safe. She had always been a daddy's girl. Hey, kitten, he greeted her softly, his arms wrapped protectively around her shoulders as he kissed the top of her head. Her heart swelled at the nickname. It always made her feel closer to him, almost as though he were declaring her as his partner in crime, the cat burglar and his kitten. An unstoppable force if she were to one day be allowed to join the family business, something that seemed to become less of a possibility every day that her father decided not to take back his turn towards all things moral and righteous. Perhaps once they finally escaped, Felicia could help her father see reason. It was silly to risk their lives over something so petty, especially if they gave in and sold the elusive formula, then they would even be monetarily rewarded for it. If only she knew what the formula consisted of. Then perhaps she could have taken things into her own hands and ended all this months ago. I've missed you so much, Dad, Felicia said, burying her face into his shoulder in order to properly hide the pesky tears that kept escaping. After a moment, he pulled away as her mother approached, where he took her into his arms and gave her a deep, yet tender, kiss. It felt so good to see her family together and whole once more. It brought a watery smile to her lips. This was only solidified when her father drew back just enough to make room for them both in his arms, and Felicia went forward greedily, tucked into his right side with her mother on his left. My two favorite girls. Oh how I've missed you. Her heart had never been so full. And she vowed right then and there that she would never take her father's presence for granted ever again. But of course, their reunion had to be cut short. A clearing of one of the nearby men's throats broke them apart and Felicia looked up to see a stout man with brown hair, a clean-shaven face, and dressed in a suit, approach them. We'll need to be going now, the man said with a nod of his head towards the sky behind them. Felicia turned to see what he was indicating, only for her eyes to turn wide at the bright drone illumination of Spider-Man's mask as it lit up against the dark backdrop of the night. Spider-Man? He was involved in this? Despite herself and the situation, her heart fluttered the tiniest bit. She hadn't forgotten their one encounter when he had broken into their home, somehow surviving her father's military-grade security system against all odds. That alone had impressed her. But on top of that, there was just something so charming about his demeanor. It was almost shy, but entirely captivating. Spider-Man was quite the mysterious specimen, and Felicia always did like a good mystery. Yes, of course, her father spoke for the entire family to the man, gathering them close with the intention to herd them into the copter, thank you, Mr. Hogan, on behalf of my family. But Mr. Hogan hadn't been able to adequately respond to her father's gracious gratitude. Because in the very next moment, 
Three men armed with guns rushed them from behind, each grabbing hold of one of them. Felicia cried out and immediately struggled against the strong grip that was attempting to hold her arms down. Before a beefy arm came around her neck and she could feel the barrel of the gun pressed against her temple. Whoa! Whoa! Mr. Hogan resisted, trying to push off the arms that were attempting to restrain him. When Mr. Hogan proved to be difficult, the gangster pulled his gun on him and... Bang! A gunshot to Mr. Hogan's shoulder had him shouting in pain, his movement ceasing entirely as blood began to weep from the wound through his suit jacket. The gangster lifted the blunt end of his gun and banged it against Mr. Hogan's temple, knocking the man unconscious as he fell to the ground in a heap. She stopped fighting. Frozen in shock and fear. Her mom had also been grabbed and was standing as still as can be. It was only her father who hadn't been grabbed, as he looked on in horror at his family in the clutches of burly armed men. The beat of several seconds passed, as they waited for the next course of action. What did these men want? Why were they silent? Wouldn't they have demands that they should be making right about now? Felicia fought to tamper down her emotions, attempting to find a mask of calm, which her father seemed to imitate as well, forcing a level of composure as he held his hands up in the air in surrender. Whatever it is you want, you can have it, her father said in a slow and deliberate tone, honey. I'll pay you whatever you want. Just don't hurt my family. But the men merely looked on at her father with steely gazes, not saying a single word. So now he wants to make a deal. A deep, gravely voice resounded from behind her father and down the boardwalk. Everyone's attention snapped to him and Felicia's eyes widened at the sight of the man. Towering at six feet tall, Felicia couldn't help but notice how hideous he actually was. With his large, protruding forehead that was flattened on the top. He wore a crisp, navy blue suit with a black tie. A fat cigar hung out of the corner of his mouth as he approached casually with his hands shoved into his pants pockets. You could have just sold the formula to us and none of this would have happened in the first place. It seemed that her father had no response to that. In fact, all the blood seemed to drain from his cheeks and he was only able to mutter one word, his tone completely drenched with despair. Hammerhead. Hammerhead nodded once, lifted his left hand to hold the blunt of his cigar taking a moment to inhale a large hit of smoke before he slowly let it out in a puff. Then with casual deliverance, Hammerhead reached into the inner pocket of his suit jacket, producing a gun. With a click, he turned off the safety and pointed the barrel right at her father's chest. Let's take a ride, Hardy. Her dad nodded seriously, before he turned back to face them while saying, I'll be going for a little ride with this man here. Why don't you wait here for me until I get back, honey? Kitten. No, they're also coming with, Hammerhead said, his deep voice more insistent. And as he said this, Felicia felt the gun press more firmly against her temple. Dad? She asked, her eyes wide, looking to him for guidance. If I were you, I would tell your kitten to shut the fuck up if you knew what was good for her, Hammerhead said, deadly serious. It will be all right, Felicia. Just do as he says, her father reassured and Felicia nodded, allowing herself to be patted down as they confiscated her phone, watching as they did the same to her mother, father, the unconscious Mr. Hogan, and the helicopter pilot. She couldn't help but wonder who these men were. This hammerhead seemed to be the ringleader, that much Felicia could tell. But she recalled that hammerhead had said to her father that if he had just been willing to sell the formula to them in the first place, none of this would be happening. Which meant that there was hope that they would escape this alive if her father cooperated with them accordingly by giving them the details of the formula. Something that she knew that her father had memorized with his photographic memory. She found her fear ebbing away as her brain rationalized this, a level of forced calmness washing over her, knowing that when it came down to the formula and his family? Her father would pick his family. No questions asked. After their belongings had been taken from them, Felicia dutifully followed along when the gunman pushed her toward the helicopter, trying to keep her head down and her eyes averted as she was pushed to enter the cab of the flying vehicle. The very thing that was previously going to be used for their escape. How ironic that it was now being used to kidnap them. Once everyone was on board, the doors to the copter were closed and Felicia and her parents were all strapped in, guns still drawn on them so that they didn't try anything risky like Mr. Hogan had. Fly. Hammerhead commanded the pilot once everyone was settled, and following afterward the loud whipping sound of the wings spinning with increasing speed met her ears. Tombstone will be expecting us soon. Tombstone? 
The name sent a wave of unease down her spine while also managing to spark her curiosity. Yet another mystery. Her father did always say to her that her curiosity would be the death of her one day. At the mention of Tombstone, she watched as a cold sweat broke out on her father's forehead, his face still drained of all color. And she lost all of her faith that this intended meeting with Tombstone was going to go over smoothly. If her father was afraid, then she had reason to fear as well. The whir of the helicopter's wings sped up to the point now where they were able to go airborne and so they began to ascend. Climbing to such heights that they began flying over the East River. There was no going back now. What was going to happen now? Would they be simply locked up once they arrived at their destination? Or would she have to mentally prepare herself with the idea that she was about to be tortured? Perhaps even killed? She squeezed her eyes tight, counting to ten in her mind while continuing to try to maintain control over her emotions. Her blubbering to these men to release her and her family would do nothing except sacrifice her own dignity. She would be stoic in the face of all that was to come, that much she was adamant about. They were flying northeast, up the river and headed in the direction towards the Brooklyn Bridge. It was only a few minutes into their flight where her father tried to appeal to Hammerhead. Joseph, don't call me that. Hammerhead growled, cutting her father off, which had her dad hold his hands up, attempting to appease. Right, sorry, I her father broke off and tried again, is there any way to work this out without bringing us to Tombstone? You and I can try to make a deal. I've got money. Just name the amount and, no chance. Hammerhead glowered, glaring at her father, with his heavy brows like a thunderous cloud down over his eyes. If I make a deal with you and let you go, I'm the one that's as good as dead. Not you. They fell silent after that, the only noise coming from the whipping sound of the helicopter wings and the engine itself. Felicia decided to look out the window, watching the Manhattan skyscrapers begin to pass them by. It was just as they were flying over the Brooklyn Bridge, when Felicia spotted something in the distance. She sat up straight, attempting to more properly see. As a figure on a flying contraption sped closer and closer to them. Her heart leapt in her chest, at first thinking that it could be someone that could help to rescue them. But as the figure flew ever closer, she saw more details of their appearance. And her face drained of all color and a chill wafted through her entire body. Because she knew the telltale green costume with purple accents anywhere. Every New York citizen did. How could they not when he was responsible for helping to terrorize New York for the last six years? Every New Yorker knew of the Green Goblin. Felicia had been the first one to notice the flying madman as he encroached upon the copter, but she hadn't been the only one. Hammerhead happened to glance in the same direction as her and had to do a double take when he spotted the superpowered crime lord. Ah, shit, he cried out, with the first bout of genuine emotion she had seen from him yet. His face displayed an adequate amount of horror that fit with the situation at hand, then Hammerhead turned to his lackeys and snapped demanding fingers in their direction, before yelling over the noise of the engine, shoot him down. We'll all die if we don't. Shoot him down now. But the command was given too late. The Green Goblin was upon them in the next second, tearing off the side door of the helicopter as though it were made of nothing more than a flimsy sheet of paper and tossing it aside so that it fell to the river below. Alarms from the aircraft immediately began to blare in warning at the missing door. The armed men inside of the cabin all pointed their guns, aiming to shoot the goblin down from the sky just as Hammerhead commanded of them. But the goblin got the jump on them first once again, throwing his infamous razor bats into the area with such precision that it cut the throats open of all three goons with one clean swipe. A scream caught in Felicia's throat as she watched the blood pour out from their wounds, an unwilling observer as all three choked on the hot liquid before falling over in a heap, one by one. She did actually scream when the man closest to her fell over like a heavy rag doll to her lap, his blood staining the designer blue jeans that she wore. But in the face of the deaths, the green goblin only laughed, throwing his head back in the air as though he had just heard the most hilarious joke. Shaking, Felicia looked up and connected eyes with her parents, both of their expressions mirrored exactly how she felt in that very moment. But out of the corner of her eye she saw that Hammerhead was still alive, despite still being armed. Why hasn't he shot yet? He had a clear opening. The Green Goblin wasn't even actively paying attention, too busy cackling like a madman. But still, Hammerhead did nothing. Merely sat there with a calculating gleam in his heavy eyes. Perhaps coming up with a plan? When the Goblin finally calmed down, his gaze immediately zeroed in on her father, 
and a slow sinister grin grew on his face, where Felicia finally noticed how bloody and beaten it appeared. Hello, Plan B, the goblin practically purred, staring menacingly at her father's face. And Felicia immediately caught on to the goblin's intentions. The goblin was here for her father. He was here to steal him away. No, she cried, trying with all her might to fight against the harness that kept her in place. Her efforts only helped in succeeding in pushing off the dead man on her lap. There was no doubt in her mind that if the goblin captured her father, then he would be tortured in the most gruesome manner possible, until he was on the very brink of death. And she couldn't stand the thought of her father being in that much pain. Boss, Hammerhead suddenly said, with a nod of his head towards the goblin. As though this were nothing more than a simple meeting that required a courteous greeting. The goblin's beady eyes shifted over to him, and his grin grew more malevolent, if that was even possible. And hello to you, traitor. Hammerhead froze for a few seconds, but to her, it felt much longer than that from the tension in his shoulders combined with the anxious expression displayed on his features. Tea traitor? Hammerhead said, forcing his shoulders to relax as he tried to regain a level of the cool demeanor he had carried before. But it was nowhere near fooling anyone. I could never betray you, boss. I was just about. Don't you even lie to me, Hammerhead. The goblin raged as he pointed an accusing finger at the man's protruding forehead, I know the truth. You are in bed with Tombstone, my business rival. I, save your breath, Hammerhead, the goblin cut him off before his sinister grin once again grew on his lips, the underlying and unspoken threat of what was to come being displayed there, they will soon be your last. That was when Hammerhead finally raised his gun, pointing the barrel directly at the green goblin's head. But the goblin reached out, as fast as a cobra, and latched onto the gangster's wrist, twisting it with a powerful snap that broke Hammerhead's hand. The gun fell to the cabin floor in a clatter. Felicia's greedy eyes followed it as it slid along the flood in the opposite direction of where she sat, too far for her to even dream of reaching it for herself. Once more, she struggled against the harness that kept her locked in place, desperate now for escape so that she could have a hope at survival. The goblin turned his attention back to her father then, reaching out to grab his chin as if trying to get a better look at him. The cat burglar and I, on the other hand, we're going to have a hell of a time. With a snap of his wrists, the goblin successfully tore at the harness that had been keeping her father in place before reaching down to bunch at the fabric of his shirt in his green fist, lifting him out of his seat and out of the helicopter cabin so that his feet were now dangling in the air. The only thing that was keeping him from falling to his death was the hold that the goblin had on her father's fragile clothing. Felicia and her mother cried out at the sight and doubled their efforts in trying to escape. She couldn't look away from the sight of pure terror on her father's features as she screamed for him, only he looked more terrified for them rather than himself. The goblin let loose a laugh of maniacal victory, holding her father up as though he were nothing more than a prize he had won. Then he turned his attention back inside the cabin, connecting gazes with Hammerhead, who was holding his broken wrist tenderly to his chest. Enjoy your watery grave, my dear Hammerhead. After all, all sharks belong in the sea. No one had time to react before the green goblin produced what looked to be a miniaturized pumpkin that he threw upward at the helicopter's wings. Boom. The explosion shook the entire aircraft, which had Felicia and her mother screaming as the helicopter began to plummet towards the water below. The last thing that she heard from her father was of him screaming their names as the goblin flew him away, cackling like a raving lunatic. A.N., feel free to hate me. But is it too much for me to request that you leave a comment below of your thoughts? I hope that it was worth the wait. Thank you all so much for reading. I appreciate you all so much.